move on to the next session which is uh, a thing which we are facing in the clinic every day so dr shubha patke who is the head of uh, department of medical genetics at stpgi will be chairing the session and she'll be introducing the speaker vinod karya over to shubha thank you dr amita uh, very interesting uh, conference i am enjoying since yesterday of course lot of things we uh, hardly know about so much of developments in immunology but ngs is really has changed the diagnosis of monogenic disorders of all systems including uh, immune system so now in this session we have an expert dr vinod skeria a fellow of royal society of biology who is a scientist at csr institute of genomics and integrative biology and adjunct the faculty at indraprastha institute of information technology in delhi everybody uh, who is working in ngs must have read his book and he is known for uh, sequencing the first indian genome he is pioneer in the area of clinical genomics in india and they have formed the large clinical network in area of rare diseases labeled as guardian his special interest in uh, immunodeficiency dis uh, diseases is also well known as uh, we have seen some papers with his collaboration in the previous sessions and he has recently described a large cohort of hyper igd syndrome so ngs is a, like a miracle in diagnostics of monogenic disorders but the dark side of it is if you get to see vus and then really it's a challenge for the clinician as well as the laboratory person so uh, dr skeria is the expert uh, in ngs and i think he will take a, make us the task of dealing with us easier and i request him to uh, uh, deliver his talk thank you thank you professor fadke for the nice introduction and uh, uh, thank you professor amdakarwal for inviting me here so over the next 20 minutes or so uh, i took also the liberty to change a bit my, the title of my talk because i'm sure a lot of uh, students out here would really be worried what we was is all about so i will probably over the next 20 minutes or so give a very broad overview of uh, analyzing and interpreting clinical uh, uh, variants uh touching upon uh, a few factors that are very important uh, while annotating these variants and also some examples of how we have gone about uh doing clinical validation uh, of such uh, variants of unknown significance or uncertain significance um uh, i will not really touch upon pid specifically because of course there are a variety of other talks uh, out here now for all clinicians out there uh there are a variety of clinical conditions that come to you Uh, uh, a vast majority of them could be uh, because of environmental influences uh, like infections uh, a small amount of them could be because of pure genetic conditions where pid and auto inflammatory diseases or syndromes could uh, fall in now there is a vast variety in, in in the molecular pathology of these disorders uh, on one end of the spectrum you talk about complex and uh, common disorders and other end of the spectrum you talk about rare and simple mendelian disorders now broadly you need to classify these disorders based on the effect size or what we call as the odds ratio or the relative risk of a genetic variant uh, in in the causality of the disease and of course in the other end of the spectrum you could classify them by the frequency of genetic variants as they occur in different populations so uh, as you see here on one end of the spectrum you would have common disorders which are caused by common variants but each of these variants have very small effect sizes or relative risk and then therefore these are not really the causative variants or their multiple variants which come together to sort of be associated with the disease on the other end of the spectrum you have rare genetic condition or what we call as mendelian genetic disorders where the effect sizes are enormously large or in other words if you have the genetic mutation in an individual you would be able to predict with very utmost certainty that the individual will develop the disease now the methods and tools to look at such conditions and the genetic test or approaches to understand such conditions are also distinctly very different uh, for common disorders at least in the research domain we use an approach called the genome wide association study uh, the principle of this is that you have uh, snps or polymorphisms spaced across the genome and you look for associations of these genetic variants on the other end of the spectrum what we use is sequencing Uh, this could be a gene sequencing this could be an exome or a panel sequencing this could be genome sequencing and so on and so forth to be able to understand the causal genetic variant 
and be able to identify the molecular pathology. Now, when we come to genetic testing, there are of course a variety of genetic tests that are available. And what you need to keep in mind is that you need to test appropriately. You should not test less, you should not test more. You should actually pick up the right test for the kind of condition that you come across. So broadly, this test can be dependent upon uh, the, the, the specificity of the locus. So if the disease have a very specific locus, the best examples would be, for example, XLA, X-ring gamma globulinemia. It has a very specific locus. It is in the BTK gene. It's on the X chromosome. So in that particular case, you need to test only for the gene if that test is available. Now, depending upon the specific locus, you could also have uh, different kinds of tests. You could have mutations which should be screened. Uh, if they are single mutations or uh, small insertion deletions, or if uh, you have large deletions, like for example, in at least some cases of XLA, you could use an approach called MLPA to uh, query or assay for specific deletions. Now, there are a variety of conditions where there is no one gene, there are multiple locus which are in, uh, influencing that particular gene or, or disorder. Then what you do is to use targeted panels, and targeted panels are of multiple different varieties and comes in different shades. Uh, on one of the spectrum, you would have small gene panels, you could have clinical exome sequencing, you could have whole exome sequencing, and in some cases, you might approach a whole genome sequencing because none of the above worked. So depending upon the specificity of this phenotype and some a priori information about what are the kind of genetic variants that occur in a particular disease, you could select what is the appropriate test. Now, on the extreme right end of the spectrum, you would have a very specific set of uh, tests which are very widely used, and these are for chromosomal abnormalities. So, these are much lesser resolution, but can cover a large amount of the chromosomal region, and these are typically uh, limited to uh, syndromic occurrences of diseases, where we know that there are very specific abnormalities in the chromosome structure or organization which can cause a particular disease. Now, so what you need to keep in mind is that depending upon the disease, you need to pick the right test and administer the right test. Now, the problem in, in many clinical situations is that you don't administer the right test. I'll give you a, a, an example. And this is an example from very early on. And this is, I believe, from 2015. Um, uh, and these patients were referred to us from, by a dermatologist from D.Y. Patil Hospital. Now, as you see here, there are two kids. One, was, uh, one kid was eight years and the other kid was 12 years. Uh, they were tested at multiple different places before and it came with an abnormal chromosomal uh, karyotype with a 22Q12 duplication. Now, is this the test of choice for lamellar ichthyosis? The answer is probably no. And this also probably points us to uh, another uh, important factor is that two children affected with a similar genetic disease would also mean that genetic counseling was never probably uh, appropriately provided to these uh, children. So the appropriate test for this condition is uh, probably a, a, a small gene panel or a, a whole exome sequencing uh, because there are nine genes which are involved in lamellar ichthyosis. Uh, the whole exome sequencing was done. The mutation was identified. A Sanger sequencing test was uh, provided. And of course, kids with TGM1 mutations could uh, respond quite well to retinoic acid. And as you see here, an appropriate genetic test might actually save a lot of money, a lot of time and provide appropriate treatment to the children but not just that, can provide evidence-based genetic counseling and the family could have a perfectly normal child. Now, depending upon this test that you administer, there are a variety of tests that are now available. And I'll, at this moment, delve just about sequencing-based tests. On one in the spectrum, you have single gene test. When there is a single gene that causes the disease, things like sickle cell anemia or thalassemia, you don't do an exome sequencing, you do just that gene sequencing. When the clinical diagnosis is accurate, a specific locus is known, this is what you do. On the other end of the spectrum, you have what we call as panels. Panels come, as I said, in multiple different shades. There could be small number of genes in a panel, like for example, cardiomyopathy panel or primary immune deficiency panel, or you could do whole exome sequencing, which is in, in some ways also a panel testing, depending upon the genes that are in there. And this is typically when you have multiple genes or multiple gene locus, which cause a disease. And it is very effective and, uh, uh, in terms of time and in terms of cost because it covers a large number of genes all in one single shot. And then therefore, it's a very useful uh, approach when you have multiple genes or loci involved in a disease. On the extreme right end of the spectrum, you have what we call as whole genome sequencing. 
it's not really uh, applicable in clinical situations yet, at least in India, but there are now in many countries where whole genome sequencing has become the mainstay. And this is extremely useful in extre undiagnosed genetic conditions where you have exhausted all the other opportunities and uh, the advantage being that it is all tests combined into one. And the limitation of course is that it's still expensive, uh, at least twice expensive today as a whole exome sequencing test. Now, after you do a sequencing test, what do, what do people do? What they do is essentially that the reads that are generated after next generation sequencing are aligned to the reference genome. And depending upon the positions at, the, at, at the which they align, and depending upon the positions at which they are different from each other, you call what we call as genetic variants. Now, genetic variants are typically filtered, uh, uh, and there are a variety of approaches to filter genetic variations. And the commonly used approaches to be based on the phenotypes of the, uh, of the genetic disease. And they are then further evaluated to understand the clinical impact. And then a report is prepared and handed it over to the clinician. And that's when the clinician gets a report and sorts of looks at it. Now, there has been a paradigm shift, at least in the very recent past, in, in, in the way genetic testing is done. Typically, in a clinical setting, what a clinician does is looks at the patient, uh, sort of uh, makes a mental map of the disorder or, or the spectrum of uh, disorders that could be possible. Uh, a specific clinical uh, genetic test is ordered. Uh, the variance that sort of maps, the phenotype is sort of interpreted, and then a clinical decision is made. Now, there are, of course, very big fallacies to such an approach because you always try to look for a variant which can explain the phenotype, which in many cases may not be the right way to do. So there is now what we call as evidence-based genomics, where the genetic test is first done, and then the evidence on each genetic variant is evaluated, and then a clinical interpretation is done. And in many, in many ways, this is statistically more robust because this is essentially evidence-based. And there's a reason why such an approach is increasingly being used. And the reason is that uh, we think that whole genome sequencing is increasingly going to be the mainstay of genetic testing. And to give numbers, today they are close to around 15 million genomes that has been sequenced across the world uh, uh, compared to uh, just less than uh, a million genomes that has been sequenced for rare genetic conditions. So in other, in, in other words, there are far more number of individuals who have a genome that is available who don't have a clinical phenotype yet than individuals who have been sequenced based on a clinical phenotype. Now, of course, this has many advantages, and one of the advantages is that it is fast. Uh, today, a whole genome sequencing is much faster than a whole exome sequencing, and probably we expect that in a year or a couple of years, whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing would approximately become at the same cost. And then, of course, this has a lot of advantages because uh, there are time-critical applications like neonatal ICUs uh, and, for example, uh, primary immunodeficiencies where diagnosis and early diagnosis is uh, really, really important. Such methodologies could really become the mainstay of clinical genetic testing. Now, once you have the genome information or genomic variants, uh, you need to evaluate evidence. And what we use to eval evaluate evidence globally is what we call as the ACMG and the AMP uh, guidelines. Now, the ACMG and the AMP guidelines are based on uh, approximately eight major domains, uh, encompasses 28 standard attributes. And using these attributes, you can eventually classify a genetic variant in one of the five categories, uh, pathogenic, likely pathogenic, benign, likely benign, and BUS or variants of unknown, uncertain or unknown significance. Now, these domains can largely be divided into two classes, one which are based on databases or a prior information. Uh, this includes computational tools, which includes type of the genetic variant, which includes population frequency or a dilute frequency of the genetic variant, and of course, uh, there are also information which are dependent upon the protein or the data uh, or the uh, protein domain information for each of these genetic variants. So depending upon them, there are around 17 attributes which can be classified extensively based on computational tools and computational databases. And of course, there are another 11 attributes of this 28, which extensively come from either functional studies. Functional studies could be in vitro or in vivo studies in cells or in our whole organism. They could be familial segregation studies, which, be, which are based on extended pedigree analysis. They could be association studies, and or for, of course, the allelic effect studies, which are in, in, in many ways based on the extended family analysis uh, to establish whether the variants are in cis or trans. So 
when a, a, a clinical interpretation of a particular variant uh, comes to us and you have reached to a point say, saying that it is a VUS, there are only very few things that you can actually add value in terms of adding evidence to change the annotation. And first and foremost of this is functional studies. And there is no rule of the thumb on what is a functional study that you need to do. There are a variety of functional studies which could range from uh, expression studies uh, of the RNA, expression studies at the protein level. This could be cell-based or morphological studies. That could be whole organism studies when, for example, you, you sort of look for an organism pathology. And of course, what is really more important and clinically applicable uh, in most cases is familial segregation studies. The variety of approaches you could do this either by uh, uh, evaluating an extended pedigree of individuals in the same family or uh, sharing information with, with other clinicians who would have observed other families changeable as the population allele frequency resources, which could be made better. And uh, of course, I will delve a bit deeper into it a few slides from now. I'll give you example, uh, probably just two examples on how we sort of approach such a problem. And uh, this is one such example, which has been extensively worked up by multiple different departments from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in Delhi. Uh, a child, uh, the first uh, born child of, of, uh, of a family, uh, with apparent uh, mitochondrial disorder, uh, multiple tests showing mitochondrial disorder. The mitochondrial sequencing was, of course, was the first line of choice, but of course it revealed nothing. So we went ahead and did a whole exome sequencing, which also revealed nothing. So the, the, the rule of thumb is that if you have exhausted all the other options, probably do a whole genome sequencing. We did a whole genome sequencing and what we found was a chromosomal deletion, a small deletion of approximately around 142 KB, which is homozygous in the child. Of course, we could not save this child, uh, but of course the family went ahead and did have uh, uh, another, uh, another pregnancy. And that the child was also tested positive for this homozygous deletion. Now, does it prove that the homozygous deletion causes the disease? The answer is no, because one, this is a mitochondrial disorder. So we expect to have a mitochondrial pathology. Second, you have a homozygous chromosomal deletion. We have not never observed this before. Doesn't necessarily mean that that is a pathogenic variant. So the only way in such situations to actually establish a pathogenicity is to actually make the exact same chromosomal deletion in a model organism. So that is number one opportunity. What we use is zebrafish. Zebrafish essentially has homologs for almost all genes in humans or almost all disease causing genes in humans. So we could make the exact gene mutation or deletion using a CRISPR-Cas technology and therefore go back and evaluate the phenotype of zebrafish. The second approach you can do is uh, of course uh, much more laborious. You can isolate uh, fetal skin fibroblast, you can culture them and to do a mitochondrial assay. And here is what you see in the mitochondrial assay. The mitochondrial respiratory chain was particularly shut down in the fetal fibroblasts compared to the uh, normal controls. So put these two evidence together, that is functional evaluation of the uh, chromosomal abnormality, we sort of substantiate that, that chromosomal small deletion of 142 kilobases can cause a mitochondrial genetic abnormality. Of course, we could go back and prove that this particular gene is involved in mitochondrial respiratory chain. There are a lot of chromosomal genes which are now implicated in mitochondrial disorder. And of course, you could build a MLPA assay for this, for this very specific chromosomal abnormality. And then therefore, for the further pregnancies, you could apply this tool to evaluate the, the, the products of conception and then We seem to have lost some connection with Dr. Vinod. Yeah, he's frozen. Yeah, we know you're back here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so this is the second family and this uh, family was referred to us from the Christian Medical College, Vellur. And uh, this was a 29 year old male who uh, complained of intermittent periodic fever for the last five years, multiple rounds of diagnosis or uh, proved nothing. And uh, this was referred to us uh, with a provisional diagnosis of periodic fever. Now the index case is uh, marked in here. Uh, we did an exome sequencing uh, for this uh, family and uh, what we found uh, was nothing. Uh, so only a heterozygous variant uh, in the MEFE gene, uh, 
causing family methionine fever. Heterozygous variants uh, do not cause uh, family methionine fever because it's a recessive condition. Now, on close examination, what we realized is that we missed the variant because this was essentially a biallelic variant, uh, uh, just one nucleotide apart. Most of the variant callers that we use in next generation sequencing would not call uh, such variants. So manual inspection, one nucleotide apart, and as you see here, they're mutually excluded in the alleles. We did an extended family pedigree and analysis, which suggested that one of the one of the variant was paternal, the other one is maternal, sort of establishing the pathogenicity of this variant. And of course, there are also additional things that you can do, which doesn't really impact uh, the assessment of the variant, but also in terms of proving that this variant had, uh, or this individual had a different ancestry, this individual had actually Middle Eastern ancestry. So genomic evidence can actually be put into context to sort of establish such ancestry and to also sort of give additional evidence that this is the variant that we're sort of looking forward to. Now, the other thing that you need to keep in mind is that a lot of uh, clinicians out there categorize variants which are available in ClinVar and take it for the face value. And really, you should not do that because most of the variants, I would say approximately 35% of the variants to give a number, are actually misclassified or misannotated even in public databases like ClinVar. And this is one such example. Uh, I have seen a lot of reports for this particular variant, which has come across uh, from multiple different centers for Alstrom syndrome. What we know today is that this is not a pathogenic variant. This is an extremely frequent uh, polymorphism found in Indian population. So you need to have public databases to, to look at allele frequencies. This is one of the oldest public databases that we have put together called SAGE, which published in 2019, 2018, sorry. And very recently in 2021, we have a new database, which is called Indigen, which encompasses 1,029 odd individual genomes spread from across the country. And uh, this is publicly available, and I'm sure as uh, clinicians, you should be able to access this uh, without any restrictions. And the other opportunity is to be able to share genotypes and phenotypes of patients with the with anticipation that uh, if you have seen a patient with a particular genotype, there are also a very large chance that there is some other clinician who has also found another uh, patient with the same genotype. And individually, you would all classify them as a VUS, but put together by segregation studies, you could now classify them as a pathogenic or a likely pathogenic. So that requires platforms to share genetic information. This is one of the platforms that we use extensively in the Guardian Consortium. It's called Variant Share. I'm sure you can make a login and you can start using it. Now, what's very important is that genomic evidence is very dynamic. That necessarily means that the evidence that is there today might not be the evidence and the classification for a particular variant tomorrow. And this necessarily means that you need to have reporting in a very dynamic format, factoring in the evidence. And therefore, this is very important in, in, in diseases, especially things like primary immunodeficiency disorders, where the patients are on long-term treatment or long-term care. And therefore, we have sort of rolled out this uh, particular mechanism, which is a card and an app, which was launched uh, late 2019 by the Honorable uh, Minister uh, for Health. And the idea of this is that the evidence would get updated on a constant basis. Uh, the genomes remain a constant uh, from the day you're born to the day you, are di you have died. But nevertheless, the evidence on genetic variations on this genome would be dynamic and would change according to evidence. To put some numbers, uh, just the analysis uh, of data from our own uh, cohorts have revealed close to 10 to 15% more yield uh, just after three to four years. I think I'll stop there and take questions, but before that, uh, the, uh, I'll just put a minute uh, to discuss about the PID cohort uh, and three people who sort of put together this cohort, uh, Dr. Geeta Kovindaraj, uh, Dr. Sridhar, who is my colleague, and Abhinav, who has been a graduate student in my lab, presently graduating out. And uh, of course, we have uh, been working very closely with a large number of clinicians to educate them about uh, these guidelines and how to implement them in clinical settings. We are uh, in the last leg of the first international con uh, symposium, uh, which was attended by around 1,000 individuals from 30 different countries. We will have a second course very, uh, uh, very close by sometime in July 2021. Uh, if you're interested, please do let us know. Thank you very much. So Shubha, are you there? Uh, hello. Uh, yeah, uh, great talk. I'm sure uh, many youngsters and uh, clinicians who are new to this NGS technology will be uh, 
happy and may feel com little com more comfortable <laughs> with uh, while ordering these AGS based testing as well as interpreting results. So um, it's a right lo lot of uh, experience he has put in his uh, slides. So there are some questions and uh, from the chat box, which I shall read, which are of course, uh, the questions, the answers are very big, already answered, but some of them briefly, maybe uh, uh, Dr. Vinod can uh, uh, say. So Ashwin is asking, are gene panels for diseases where mutations are known available or have to be designed? Yeah, so uh, the problem with gene panels uh, at least is that uh, uh, the gene, genes and implications in diseases are also an evolving topic. Like for example, if you look at primary immunodeficiency disorders, five years ago, this was around 280 genes. Today, we have around 400 genes. Now, it is almost impossible to create gene panels which can keep pace with the developments in genomics. So I would preferably not recommend it, at least for conditions like uh, primary immunodeficiency conditions, because there are a few hundreds of tests that are done annually. Uh, but probably a uh, whole exome sequencing or a clinical exome sequencing would be better in terms of workflows. Uh, but having said that, there are some disorders where the testing is very large in number. The best examples would be hereditary cancer syndromes. Uh, other examples would be cardiac canalopathies or cardiomyopathy panels, where, where you expect to have hundreds of samples to be tested even annually. And then therefore panels would be cost effective. But it, it, it depends upon the field uh, number of genes and the dynamicity of, uh, of evidence that is emerging in that particular field. Uh, will it be useful that do the whole exome sequencing and look virtually at the gene panels, like important genes known at that particular time, immunodeficiency disorders and so on, such type of things are routinely used mm -hmm. in clinical uh, diagnostics yes that is something that is routinely used in clinical diagnostics and that is why why i said that there is a small problem with that and to give you a few examples what i would say is that many of these disorders which are pathogenic but otherwise polymorphic in the population what you realize is that if you go back to the publication these are individuals who have been tested elsewhere right so essentially look at a case where for example somebody has uh, looked at say xla right and send a sample abroad so for example, one of the European or American laboratories, they would test for that particular gene. They would find a mutation which can fit the profile and they would report it as pathogenic. Now that is wrong because that might be a polymorphism back here in the population. They don't have access to the Indian population data. Therefore, they have no way to assess it about the pathogenicity. So therefore, you need to actually factor in the evidence first uh, rather than the phenotype first. So this is the most important message, but whatever sequence variation you identify before labeling it as causative or pathogenic, one should look at these all uh, information so that yes, the proper conclusions can be drawn and no wrong labeling of the um, diagnosis should be done. And most importantly, many of the times this uh, mutation based data is used for prenatal diagnosis. So if your mutation uh, this sequence variation is not really pathogenic, then there will be maybe false uh, errors in the prenatal diagnosis. Right, and this is so happening. No, this is happening very rampantly. Yeah, so the one has to be very clinicians have to be very careful. So I think uh, time is less. So one more question from Dr. Manisha: How you reliable is uh, how to use NGS based? Uh, um, testing for diagnosis detection of big deletions and do we need to confirm by MLP or other techniques? Yes, the quick answer is that you need to confirm it using orthogonal techniques, uh, depending upon uh, the assays that you use. It's, it's, I'm not trying to say that large deletions cannot be captured on whole exome sequencing. It can be captured even on whole exome sequencing, but nevertheless, you still have a dilemma whether it is because those probes didn't work or because it's actually a deletion. So you always need to uh, need to uh, sort of validate using an orthogonal technique, uh, depending upon the case scenario. If it's a very large deletion, you could use chromosomal microarrays. Uh, if it's a small deletion, you could use MLPS. So one last question I want to ask that as a, all clinicians and including myself, we tend to give a lot of stress uh, in, uh, to the clinical situation and correlation with the clinical findings. But as per ACMG guidelines, this is if the phenotype matches uh, with the gene identified uh, is not a very strong evidence for causative or pathogenic nature of the um, gene. 
uh, or the sequence variation. However, sometimes there are very, very specific phenotypes like nail hypoplasia in case of FOXN1 related immune deficiency or alopecia in case of uh, Seomain syndrome. So do you think such type of clinical or biochemical or immunological very, very specific phenotype you would give, give added uh, weightage to that while interpreting the sequence variation in the gene where it is, where the yeah. sequence variation. Yeah, my personal opinion, and so this is just a personal opinion, uh, is that you should not get carried away by the clinical phenotype. Uh, because if you look at a clinical phenotype and given any random genome, we have done this exercise in the lab quite, uh, I mean, this is a fun experiment that you can sort of do. We sort of uh, shuffle the genomes and uh, the clinical phenotypes, and you'll be surprised that individuals can still identify probably variants that can explain the phenotype. So that is in many ways a biased system, which can create a lot of errors and long-term implications. 